Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to this annual press conference on banking supervision. I'm Connie Lotze from the ECB Communications. And our speakers today are Danielle Nui, the chair of the supervisory board, and Sabine Lautenschläger, the vice chair of the supervisory board, and also member of the executive board. Ms. Nui and Ms. Lautenschläger will make some introductory statements before we will take your questions. And just a reminder, as you know, we released our annual report on supervisory activities last week which Ms. Nui presented to the European Parliament. So with that, let me give you Ms. Nui the floor. Danielle. Thank you, Connie. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's incredible how time flies. Just five years ago, in June 2012, the leaders of the European Union agreed to take banking supervision from the national to the European level. And here we are already presenting our third annual report. One of the most prominent issues we dealt with in 2016 was non-performing loans, or NPLs for short, and NPLs will remain a top priority for some time to come. So far, the good news is that NPLs is the euro area, in the euro area declined by 54 billion to a level of 921 billion between the third quarters of 2015 and 2016. As a result, the ratio of NPL shrank from 7.3% to 6.5%. Still, in some member states, NPLs remain a big issue. They wait on the profitability of banks and limit their ability to finance the economy. Just one week ago, we published guidance to banks on how we expect them to deal with NPLs. Banks are required to come up with a clear strategy for reducing NPLs, a strategy which includes setting ambitious and realistic targets, putting in place relevant governance on operational structures. This guidance will ensure that banks take a consistent and effective approach to reducing NPLs. But banks and supervisors are not the only ones who need to act. In some countries, legal and judicial frameworks hamper the speedy resolution of NPLs. National lawmakers should therefore act too Building on our stock take of national practices, they could make judicial systems more efficient. They could create fast out-of-court procedures. They could increase access to collateral on the line fiscal incentives. Another major project that we launched is the targeted review of internal models, or TRIM for short. Many banks use internal models to determine how risky their assets are. Risk-weighted assets, in turn, form the basics for calculating capital requirements. That makes internal models highly relevant from a prudential point of view. Over the years, banks have made their models ever, uh, ever more complex in an effort to map their risk as precisely as possible. But the more complex the internal models, the more prone they are to errors or even to manipulation. Thanks to their risk sensitivity, models are good management tools, but their outcome should also be uh, consistent and comparable. Against this backdrop, TRIM will assess how robust and reliable banks' internal models actually are. The goal is to ensure that the calculation of risk-weighted asset is driven by actual risk rather than by modeling choices. To be sure, our goal is not to increase risk-weighted assets across the board, However, we may see risk-weighted assets increase for some banks. Altogether, TRIM will help enhance the soundness of internal models and thereby make them more credible, and it will help to level the playing field for banks in the euro area. At the same time, TRIM will contribute to a more stable banking sector. <coughs> banking is not only about uh, stability. Uh, but also about profitability. And profits are a weak spot for euro area banks. Many banks in the euro area don't even earn their cost of capital. This concerns banks and investors, and it concerns us supervisors. After all, stability and profitability are the two sides of the same coin. The profitability of banks and the business models have therefore been one of our key priorities for the time now, some time now. Of course, we don't tell banks what their business model should be. What we do is to challenge their sustainability and closely monitor the issue. And we do see some profitable banks. What is their secret? Well, one feature these banks share are solid cost structures. 
this should be a hint to other banks as well. But it is not just about cost. Banks are facing many challenges those days. I already talked about NPLs, but I could also mention political uncertainty on sluggish growth, a difficult interest rate environment, stronger rules on new competitors. The world is changing, and banks should embrace that change. They need to adapt their business model to be, become profitable again. Another issue is that in some countries, banking sectors are still highly fragmented. The resulting overcapacities lead to a strong competition on weak profits. In such a situation, one should expect some banks to be pushed out of the market. In my view, there is a clear case for consolidation, for instance, through mergers and acquisitions. However, we have not seen many mergers and acquisitions so far. And any that we have seen have taken place uh, within one country, rather than across border within the euro area. This is where the banking union comes into play. The aim of banking union is to provide the foundation for a truly European banking market, one in which we should also see cross-border mergers. Banks would uh, well, become more European in scope, offer their services throughout the euro area, and benefit from a larger market. At the same time, customers could choose from a wide range of banks that are supervised according to the same ICE standards. This is our vision for the future. Thank you for your attention. Sabine, please. Our job is uh, to make banks resilient. Uh, and in doing so, it helps to create a safe and sound European banking sector, a banking sector that can be a reliable partner for the economy. And um, we can only do this job on the basis of sound regulation. Since the crisis, policymakers have made regulation stronger and amended it where it was needed. And these reforms have enabled supervisors around the world to do a better job. And they help banks to do a better job as well. Um, after all, only well-capitalized and well-governed banks can reliably finance the economy. Only stable banks can finance long-term growth and prosperity. So we need regulation, and it should be based on global standards. And the later point is crucial for us. Uh, it is another lesson from the crisis that we should not forget. To ensure stability, we need a global approach to regulation. That is why the Basel framework is so important, and that's why we have to finalize um, the Basel III reforms as quickly as possible. By now, by now um, yeah, for many issues, the solutions uh, have been put on the table, and at the end of the day, Basel III can only uh, be adopted as a package. The Basel Committee <coughs> is close to reaching an agreement, however. In that context, we welcome the G20s commitment to finalizing Basel III. Going from the global to the European level, we very much welcome uh, the current review of the European legislative framework. The European Commission has made proposals on how to adapt and amend the relevant law. The ECB will publish an official opinion on these proposals in May. And personally, I see many good things in these proposals. First, they are in line with the global approach as they transpose some global standards, such as the leverage ratio, into European law. Second, they support the idea of a banking union as they allow for capital and liquidity waivers within a banking group on an EU cross-border basis. And third, they strengthen the principle of proportionality as they seek to reduce the regulatory burden on smaller banks. Of course, there are also things that might need to be reflected on further. First, while supervisors need to be able to act quickly and flexibly, based on their expertise and judgment, some of the proposals seek to put a tight frame around supervisory actions. That would limit our ability to adapt our actions to the ever-changing financial industry, an industry that always 
looks for the best deal and sizes uh, chain chances to arbitrage the rules. Rules that cannot be adapted as quickly as banks test their limits. And second, there is still room to further harmonize the rules, for instance, instance with regard to the national options and discretions. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have talked about supervision and we have talked about regulation and there's one last issue I would li like to touch upon and that's Brexit. Over the past weeks, Danielle and I have publicly talked about Brexit and laid out how we will approach the issue and how we expect banks to approach it. So let me just briefly raise a few points. The EU and uh, UK have not started negotiation yet. Still, both banks and supervisors must prepare for any potential scenario. For the banks, it is mostly about market access. Many UK banks rely on the European passport to operate in the single market. The passport gives them access to the entire single market as long as they are established in an EU country. In the event of a hard Brexit, they might lose this passport and would have to seek another path into the single market. The most obvious option would be to obtain a banking license in an EU a country in order to regain the passport, and it, it's the ECB that grants licenses in the euro area. And to be clear, we will only grant licenses to well-capitalized and well-managed banks. We will not accept empty shell companies. Both of us already said this. Any new entity must have adequate local risk management, sufficient local staff, and operational independence. To enable banks to comprehensively comply with our requirements, we will grant bank-specific phase-in periods. In doing so, we will take into account the business activities and the risk profile of each bank. We will be cautious of regulatory and supervisory arbitrage, and we will not take part in a race to the bottom in that regard. That's why we will keep a close eye on how banking groups structure their euro area entities. Some banks might want to use a complex and diverse setup adapted to the range of activities they plan to pursue in the euro area. And many incoming banks might plan to establish significant or less significant credit institutions or to expand already existing ones. These banks would either be directly supervised by the ECB or by the National Competent Authority under, and that is the important issue, under the common European supervisory approach of the ECB. Some banking groups might also consider using a third country branch for part of their banking business, even very large in size, complexity, third country branches. Third country branches are subject to banking supervision but at a national level and according to national standards and national regime. And these standards can greatly differ from one country to another. Some national supervisors, for instance, oblige third country branches to have capital and liquidity of their own. Others do not. All this runs counter to the idea of a level playing field in the euro area. It is an invitation to engage in regulatory and supervisory arbitrage. Still, there might be a chance to address this topic as part of the current review of the European legislative framework that I have just talked about. Ladies and gentlemen, Brexit will bring major changes. That much is clear. One thing will not change, though. The financial sectors in the UK and the EU will remain closely connected. The ECB banking supervision, the SSM, we are prepared for any outcome of the negotiations, and the banks should be too. And let me assure you once again 
As supervisors, we will not participate in a race to the bottom. After all, we all share an interest in having a stable banking sector on both sides um, of the channel. And I thank you, too, very much for your attention. Thank you both. So we come to uh, questions now. We have roving microphones here somewhere. Uh, we start, yes, here in the second row. Please, the gentleman here. Thanks very much. We're on, yes. Uh, from MLEX, John Riga. Uh, can you maybe just carry on a bit about the third country branches issue? Just maybe you could say, uh, you know, what you're seeing, where the concerns might be, and, uh, you know, if there any, um, if you have any past experience with this before uh, the Brexit context. Thanks. Well, um, this is the specificity of the, of, of the EU, that you have um, legal independent entities, subsidiaries, um, under um, the um, either direct supervision or indirect oversight of um, the ECB banking supervision, but the third country branches, as they are branches and not legal and independent entities, they are outside um, of it. So you can uh, book or you know, you can be active via the branches with banking activities, but you are not then under the ECB banking supervision. This and is an important announcement. The lifts are temporarily out of order. Normal service will be resumed as soon as possible. Thank you for your understanding. As folgt eine wichtige Durchsage. Aus technischen Gründen sind die Aufzüge zurzeit nicht betriebsbereit. Die Störung wird so bald wie möglich behoben. It's good that we do not need any lifts right now. <laughs> okay. No, the, the, the question is um, not only about um, who is supervising, but rather what kind of basis, what kind of regulations are going to be applied when supervising. Right now we have this already in the SSM area. Um, some of the branches are quite big, yeah, but when you we are talking about Brexit. We have many banking groups probably coming in, and then this gets a different, um, it gets a different dimension, and it gets um, a question of how might banking groups use this kind of fragmentation in um, between national regimes and European regimes in order to ensure to get the best deal. Um, out of it. And here we do have some concerns, and here one might think about um, uh, what do you do, for example, with significant, you know, in size, significant third country branches. There, there is one easy uh, correction to that. The intermediate holding company that uh, is on the table in the revision of the CRD4, CRR, uh, the branches should be attached, should be under the this intermediate holding company for third countries, so would be uh, also part of the SSM supervision, because otherwise it is far too fragmented, as explained by uh, by Sabine. Okay, we have a here in the front row. We have a microphone here, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I've got a question on these um, phasing periods. Um, you said it's bank specific, um, so. Does it really mean you're going to have a like a, a plan for each individual bank, or will you have you know look at you know, different sizes and group banks for phasing periods? And and what do you envisage? Are we talking about a couple of months, half a year, quarters? Thank you very much. Well, first of all, it is bank, and it has to be bank specific because um, it depends on the activities, um, the scope, the size of activities. Uh, coming to us. So it depends what kind of risks are related uh, to it, what kind of information we will get um, with regard to uh, the activities done uh, under the UK uh, PRA yeah, supervision, what kind of information we will get from the PRA, and then it will be, yes, a plan for each individual bank, because if we, when we are talking about very small activities, yeah, it might not be as relevant to do it very fast, you know. Um, if somebody wants to, for example, um, 
book back to back um, a lot of activities, we will need to see it more urgent, yeah, um, to move um, into a kind of local risk management um, with specificities to whatever they book back to back. Yeah, so it is very bank specific, but nothing what is unknown to us. I mean, every bank here has um, its own, uh, what we call supervisory examination uh, plan, and uh, where we have a kind of Excel sheet um, with a lot of uh, different activities over the next three years um, uh, where we see the bank has to move to. So nothing new, it's just the question of the mass production, you know? Well, some will take months, and some might even take one or two years. Here in the front row, just we we'll go yeah, one by one. Thanks. Thank you. I've got a question on non-performing loans. The NPL problem has been out there for many years. And I'm wondering, why does it take such a long time to solve the problem? In my little simple world, I would say, why not just write it off? look at what it will cost, raise fresh capital, and then off you go. Where's the problem? First of all, when the amount is more than 900 billions for the, the SSM countries, you, you can imagine that is a, it's a big problem, uh, the, the magnitude uh, of the amount. We, st we started to address non-performing exposures with the comprehensive assessment. Uh, it was the first time we had a definition, a common definition to identify them, and that was provided by uh, EBA, this definition. Then uh, we uh, made sure they were reasonably well provisioned, uh, and it was uh, a lot of additional uh, provisions that were made uh, after the, the comprehensive assessment that included an asset quality review. So uh, after uh, some <laughs> work on discussions with the bank, we are uh, now moving to uh, one step forward. On one element we, uh, which is very important as well is that it's not only an issue for supervisors. It's an issue for national legislators, for example. Uh, there, there are countries where the capacity to repossess collateral is very small. Uh, the, also the fast-track solutions, out-of-court fast-track solutions, which are uh, the most efficient one uh, for certain categories of non-performing exposures, have to, to be developed. Uh, so that's why it takes uh, so much time. Uh, but uh, we were on a sound basis precisely because they were uh, well provisioned after the comprehensive assessment. So uh, now, after the guidance on the, what is expected uh, from the banks for this uh, management of non-performing exposures, the banks are in the process of receiving letters from us where uh, they will be asked to provide their own plan and uh, we explain uh, what we expect and what we will be uh, challenging. And we have already uh, seen action. A number of banks already uh, are going to the market uh, to clean their balance sheet in uh, one of uh, operation. Well, it has been said for Montepaschi after the, the stress test. Uh, it has, uh, we have seen a big uh, equity issuance from Unicredito, for example. Uh, and others will follow. Banco Popular Español has mentioned that it will uh, use equity to clean the balance sheet. So, we had to start by making denial impossible and gradually but very firmly going uh, to solutions. And our next step after the guidance, after the uh, plans to address the legacy assets for each bank will be our expectations for the steady state in order to make sure that there are not uh, new uh, non-performing exposures that are created while we are uh, addressing the, the old ones. But I, I am confident that uh, the, the, the speed will uh, be f faster now. But it's a very delicate issue with a lot of stakeholders, not only the supervisors. Next question in the front row here, too. Thank you very much. Francesco Canico from Reuters. You mentioned Montepaschi. Recently, the ECB provided information that the Commission had requested about Montepaschi's solvency and about 
um, its, its situation and, and the, the context of the, of the capital shortfall that you have identified. So my question is, can you give us that information too? So is Montepaschi solvent? And what happens if a bank situation deteriorates between the stress test and um, the time when the, when the precautionary capitalization is requested, like in this case? And, and my second question is, in Brussels, you uh, said that some banks may need to be unwound and um, in, in, in Europe that is an option that is, um, that is possible. Do you see many in this situation? Do you see any right now in the Eurozone in this situation? Thank you. Well, one element is not uh, fully correct in your statement. It's not recently that we have given information to the Commission. Our cooperation with the Commission, which is a sister European institution, has started long before the end of last year. So we have been constantly uh, keeping uh, the Commission posted on the, the situation, on the evolution uh, of the situation. So uh, this is uh, work that has been going for some time, and I'm sure there will be a uh, uh, close, uh, soon uh, decision uh, about the, 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 the situation. Uh, for the, the, the rest, uh, you mentioned uh, the, the solvency statements. Well, the uh, solvency uh, statement is the starting point of uh, precautionary recapitalization. So obviously, uh, this is something that has, been, uh, that has been done. Otherwise, we would not even be uh, talking about uh, precautionary recapitalization. Precautionary recapitalization is for solvent banks. Uh, for the other banks, we are uh, working with the Commission, and we have already uh, started uh, sharing uh, information. We go further here, in the front row, please. Yeah, um, or, and then you. What do you Fine. think about the proposal by Mr. Enria, creating a European bad bank to solve the problem of MPLs? Well, I am grateful to Andrea and Ria to have put uh, the issue uh, on the table uh, because uh, when you have uh, such a large amount of uh, non-performing exposures in the euro area, uh, we need uh, all the tools that are available on uh, European asset manager, European fund uh, is another possible tool. Uh, this being said, uh, it's not a uh, panacea, uh, for sure. It will not uh, fix uh, all issues. It's just one of, of the tools uh, among uh, a few, uh, few others. Uh, the interest of having a European initiative is that it uh, reduces the stigma for the banks on the countries uh, using it. And it is also uh, improving the bargaining powers uh, of the banks that are selling uh, non-performing exposures because uh, with the volume that we have, obviously, it's a market that is uh, favoring uh, the buyers, not the sellers. But if we have a strong uh, centralized uh, seller, that is improving uh, the, the situation. Uh, this being said, uh, I do not agree with all elements that are on the project, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it can be developed in uh, different ways. For example, uh, I don't think the clawback uh, is, uh, concept is, uh, is a solution because we need uh, certainty in the, in the prices. Osman, here in the front row, please. No, 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 here in the front row, please. Brexit questions again. Um, is the Brexit also a concern with regard to financial stability or is this issue completely from the table? Um, and uh, how confident, you mentioned the possibility of arbitrage, so how confident are you that you can really prevent the entry of a large number of um, uh, unsupervised third country branches which are significant? I'm sure that this thing will be dealt uh, by the EU review. And is the problem only with regard to third country br branches or also with broker dealers which are not a bank? Um, well, first of all, uh, third country branches are not unsupervised, yeah? just, just to be very precise. They are supervised, but they are supervised via an, a national regime and the regimes can be quite different. And there are some countries which oblige banks to have capital and liquidity, to have their own risk management in third country branches. And in other 
member states, the same bank with a third country branch does not need to hold capital um, and liquidity for the branch activities. Um, um, they do not look very much into um, risk management issues on, on the local basis. And there, the divergence and the heterogeneity comes and the fragmentation comes. Yeah? So um, that's about the third country branch. And you are fully correct. I did not want to blur my message, and that's why I deleted yesterday night my sentence about investment and broker, investment banking and broker dealers. This is the third um, way. I mean, so you have, uh, you have on the one side the SSM, entities, meaning directly or indirectly um, uh, supervised uh, by ECB banking supervision. Then you have the third country branches, uh, which are supervised uh, according to a national regime. And then, I just speak a little bit louder, huh? Um, and then you have the investment um, uh, uh, bankers, the broker dealers, which, which can um, include a lot of bank-like business activities which are not under the supervision of ECB banking supervision or banking supervision um, uh, uh, according to the national competent authorities, but for example under the market authorities which have a national regime um, again. Uh, and here it depends too, to be very clear, um, even in the activities whether you are a bank or not in Germany for example, just giving um, uh, loans is means you need to have a banking license and you are under banking supervision. In other countries, giving loans are outside of the banking um, supervisory scope. So you have a fragmentation in the supervisory landscape um, where you might have um, a race to the bottom. The list may now be used again. As part of a so if you want to leave now and want to use the lift, you can use it if you wish to. Yeah? No, we have a fragmented supervisory landscape, and um, it is um, um, the EU Commission proposal, which here and there reflects on it and might need perhaps here and there a little bit of adaptions and amendments um, to get that concerns with regard to arbitrage, you know, opportunities, um, uh, solved. So now, huh? Are you that well, I mean, it is so obvious and so clear that there is a certain kind of gap which needs to be closed via regulation that I'm positive <laughs> when thinking about it. But I'm not. I'm not the lawmaker, the European lawmaker. Yeah, we just can. We can just hint. Um, on issues and topics, and that's what we try to do today. Yeah? With regard to financial stability, I think everybody is quite aware what needs to be done on both sides of the channel with regard to um, um, uh, the, the, the potential transfers of activities. And you can see quite clearly here now, we listed in the last month our views on back-to-back -back booking, on uh, local risk management and governance, um, on uh, the question of third country branches, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm pretty sure that the PRA does it on the other side, so we are very active. You will find um, the overall concept um, in a kind of modular way in April on our website, so we will publish um, our positions, and we prepare for the worst case scenario. All these under the assumption yeah, of a worst case for hard Brexit. Yeah, and here, um, Mrs. Trick, I forgot your, uh, in your answer when you ask about the timing. It depends, the phase in depends quite a lot on what kind of actual regime will we have after the end of the negotiations. So to ask now um, about exact numbers of days, weeks, months, or years might be a little bit premature. Yeah. So everybody's working on it is quite aware. I would like to make one additional comment on the broker-dealer status. Uh, right now, uh, the PRA is deciding, uh, deciding based on its own judgment that broker-dealers, certain of them that are systemic, can be supervised as banks. Uh, this is exactly what we need. Uh, in the regulation, the possibility to decide that uh, certain broker-dealers are systemic enough to be 
uh, supervise exactly like banks. So as it is something clear, simple to do, we, we are quite optimistic that we will get it. And it's so obvious that otherwise it would be a weakening of the supervision. Oops. Claire Jones here in the, yeah, in the third row. Yes? Um, just, just to come back to, um, to Brexit, um, could you just clarify what you mean by a hard Brexit, please? Um, would you be happy with some sort of regulatory equivalence, or would the banks need to stay under the jurisdiction of the ECJ for you to be comfortable with them still being regulated um, outside the Eurozone and um, still able to conduct activities within the Eurozone? Um, and just to follow up on that, is the position the same as what you've laid out already for clearing? What's what's the stance on that? Um, on the issue of banking union, it seems that there's still quite a lot of elements of banking union that are incomplete. How does that um, complicate what the SSM is trying to do? Thank you. Let me start uh, for once with Brexit. <laughs> Well, uh, it's not up to us to say whether it should be hard, soft, or in between uh, Brexit. That's a political uh, decision to, to be taken. What is uh, sure for us is that uh, the UK will always be important. We will always have a very uh, important and intense uh, relationship with our colleagues uh, on the other side of the channel. We have banks that are working in the UK. They will go on uh, working in the UK. <coughs> and we will receive uh, <coughs> probably a number of um, London-based uh, current activities. So uh, for us, uh, what is important is a continuity uh, in the operation, and I am sure it's the same for uh, British colleagues, and it is the, the safety and soundness of the framework that will take place uh, after the, the, the Brexit. So, banking union, maybe now to make a change <laughs> for you, Sabine, if you wish so, otherwise I go on. Well, I mean, uh, perhaps to, uh, to the, the clearing question and the part of the central bank activities you ask about, I mean, we are here in the press conference of the banking uh, supervisors, so only a very short answer. I think um, it is for the politicians to decide um, um, in their negotiations yeah, what kind of equivalence assessment um, they see fit and how um, um, the UK will move out of <coughs> the European uh, Union. We just have to prepare for the worst case uh, scenario. And hard bre uh, Brexit means um, no passport um, for UK uh, banks anymore. With regard to your clearing questions, um, um, uh, you know that at the end, it is very, very important with regard to the clearing um, to keep a standard with regard to um, the, the regulatory and the supervisory um, um, perspectives, which is um, equivalent to what uh, we have now, and that is the minimum. Everything else is not yet discussed, and um, there is not yet an um, official... Um, opinion, legal opinion of uh, the ECB, and thus I will not say anything about the internal discussions. Um, the incomplete banking union, we have, I think, a well-functioning um, uh, resolution mechanism. We have a well-functioning uh, supervision. Um, the third leg uh, with regard to the deposit guarantee scheme has to come in order um, to um, uh, you know, to fulfill um, um, and to, to, to have the full set um, what is possible in the banking union. But I think with the two legs we already have now, we made huge steps forward uh, in addressing issues um, with regard to level playing field, with regard to, um, um, yeah, on European perspective taking into account um, um, a perspective um, with with high standards in supervision and in resolution um, activities, and I, w I will hope uh, and would hope uh, that we move forward very quickly with the third um, uh, leg too. Would you like to say something to the deposit guarantee scheme? To 
Well, why not? Yes, indeed, there is a good uh, package on the table put uh, by the, the Commission on reducing risk because uh, it has been decided, rightfully so, in my view, that uh, redu reduction of risk uh, and uh, increase of solidarity should, uh, should go together. And now we have this package that can be uh, implemented fast. We have already started with uh, SSM to uh, reduce risk, uh, reducing fragmentation, reducing uh, national options, uh, having consistent uh, threat. But uh, it's time uh, to, to go on, uh, indeed, and risk reduction on the third leg that is uh, missing will leverage each other to deliver this uh, safer and sound uh, banking system in the euro area. So we had a question. There's a question all the way in the back, Dan, please. Uh, from your point of view as European supervisors, um, how satisfied are you with the capital resources of Germany's biggest banks? Do you still uh, see a need for further improvement? And the second question is, uh, again, from your point as supervisors, do we really need systemic relevant banks, the so-called too big to fail banks for well-functioning banking system. Thank you. Well, uh, are we uh, satisfied with the level of uh, capital? Uh, well, it has significantly improved, and we believe that, indeed, uh, taking also into account pillar two, the SREP requirements, or the SREP demand now, to take into uh, account both requirements and guidance, uh, we are in the, in the steady state. Uh, so that's the that's a good uh, good move uh, forward. Uh, the second part uh, of your question, sorry, I miss it. Uh, the I <laughs> write it very poorly. I cannot read again what I. Uh, so do do we really need systemic relevant banks? Oh, sorry. The so-called too big to fail banks. Well, we need consolidation of the banking system, and uh, it can take uh, place within a country or uh, across borders. And I think it would make sense in certain cases to have cross-border uh, consolidation. Obviously, we have to take into account this uh, too big to fail issue. We don't want to create uh, uh, problems that would not be uh, solvable uh, considering a too big uh, to fail issue. Uh, but uh, there are now uh, international standards, uh, in particular uh, the ones adopted by the Financial Stability Board, uh, uh, TILAC, capital requirements, the additional regulation for uh, global CFI. So uh, there is, uh, we are well equipped also to have uh, bigger banks. But obviously, uh, we need to uh, be ready to supervise, and we are ready to supervise these uh, possibly large internationally active uh, banks. So yes, we need consolidation, but uh, obviously not to the extent that we create additional too big to fail problems, but we are well equipped now to address uh, the possibility of such problem and not increase the risk. May I add something? I'll ask back, do you think that the export-driven industry of Germany is able um, uh, to get all the financial services they need abroad in Asia, in the US, in South America, in Africa, without systemically relevant banks? Because for these kind of services, you need a broad network, you need different expertise, you need uh, economy of scales in order um, um, uh, to um, give uh, well, not only well functioning, but pricely services um, 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 to the industry. So what do you think? <laughs> We are ready to supervise such banks. And we have eight uh, global CFIs within the SSM, which in my view, just like Sabine said, is good for the, the German industry, and hopefully for the other industries as well when they recovered from the crisis. <laughs> we have a question here in the middle, in the center. Good morning. Uh, Domenico Conti for ANSA News Agency. Um, one question on uh, Italian banks. Uh, there are two Italian banks uh, from Veneto, that is Veneto Banca and uh, Vicenza. 
that have submitted initially a plan for a private uh, restructuring, and then, uh, as far as we know, they have uh, come up with a precautionary recapitalization, precautionary recapitalization plan. Can you clarify a little bit what the state of the art is as regards to these two banks? And my second question is on, on uh, your recent statement about uh, consolidation that in specific cases could take the form of, of uh, unwinding uh, banks if they become unviable. Does this mean in, in some way that the ECB supervision is mm, intended to be a little less indulgent in, in dealing with future cases? Thank you very much. Well, uh, indeed, uh, it's known that uh, these two banks uh, have asked uh, for uh, precautionary uh, recapitalization. It's, uh, public, uh, it's public news. And we have already, to be very clear, let me say that we are already sharing the information needed with the European uh, Commission. You mentioned the plan they, they had, they have, uh, of possibly merging. After a precautionary recapitalization, or part of a precautionary recapitalization, there is a plan to be discussed uh, and accepted uh, by the Commission. So it uh, may be that what they have developed for uh, private initiatives is also the way uh, it will go uh, forward uh, in the context of the precautionary recapitalization. But this has to be discussed uh, with the, the commission. There is one more actor in a precautionary recapitalization, uh, which is the, the commission that has, is in the driving seat for the resulting restructuring plan. And the fact that uh, we uh, see, uh, well, some comments about uh, unwinding uh, of banks or, well, let, let's put it in a broader context. There is a need for a consolidation of the banking systems uh, within uh, the euro area. It's not the case in each country. Uh, there are some countries where the banking systems are already pretty uh, concentrated. But globally, there is uh, room for consolidation uh, in the uh, SSM countries, in the SSM area. Uh, and uh, this uh, can take uh, many different ways. Uh, hopefully, uh, volunteering uh, mergers or concentration uh, will uh, be the, the way used to, 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 to do that. But uh, if it was... Uh, happening that uh, there was a need to use the tools that we have been entrusted to, uh, to, to act in certain cases, we will not be shy in using uh, these possibilities. There's a question, yeah, right, Alessandro, yeah. Alessandro Speciale, Bloomberg News. I have a question on the Basel talks. Um, you said that we are close to a deal and that uh, the deal can only be adopted as a package. Um, did you get a bit more visibility on what the US position on the whole uh, Basel talks are? W why, I mean, why, what is the reason for your optimism? And uh, secondly, as you mentioned uh, Brexit concerns, are you concerned that there may be a regulatory race to the bottom uh, as a consequence of it? Thank you. Well, first, no, I have not yet gotten any news uh, from the US American colleagues, but I do see that all of us are very aware that global standards um, in an industry where interconnectedness yeah, is playing a huge and important role, yeah, that this awareness um, is there everywhere, and that's why we welcome the G20 co commitment um, uh, so much, um, as they it even found um, a one sentence in the declaration um, in there in, in order to ensure that everybody knows, yeah, we need to move forward here. And, and that's why I'm optimistic and, 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 and positive. Yeah? And as I know, I mean, that all of the compromises, yeah, are on the table, and, and we just need to have a, um, a, a final meeting where we think about how we can do the uh, one or the other thing. Um, I, I just hope, and I'm positive. Yeah, but I cannot promise you. Yeah? Um, 
about uh, Brexit, the, the second uh, question was, I'm sorry, again. Um, the race to the bottom. Ah, the race to the bottom. Well, I mean, um, here and there, we, 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 we hear from banks that, um, um, that the one or the other um, um, stakeholder promises a fast delivery of licenses. And we are always very cautious. Um, and we, one should be cautious, because you do not know yet what, in what kind of range, um, in what kind of activities, um, uh, which banking group will come with what kind of structure. Um, so from, from our uh, point of view, it is, um, 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 yeah, it is um, at the core yeah, to have many, many different interviews um, uh, getting the business plans, um, the plans for, for several years to come, um, how banks want to structure their activities, how they want to grow, uh, what kind of booking um, they want to do, what kind of risk management, and it's nothing what you can do in, in, in a few weeks, but wh where you need uh, an in-depth analysis from our point of view. I would add one quick point. Uh, the SSM is an asset for, for the, the, the Brexit precisely because there is uh, no competition on uh, b pure banking supervision. We can be neutral on the cities that uh, will uh, welcome these London-based banks. Uh, obviously, uh, fragmentation uh, through broker-dealers uh, status or through uh, national uh, well branches uh, from third countries uh, would be an incentive to raise to the bottom. So that's why this fragmentation should not take place. Uh, and uh, the intermediate holding company that is on the table is the obvious uh, solution. I have two more questions, one here and one in the back there. Alessandro Merlio, will solve 24 hours. Can I ask you again about the banks that you mentioned may be uh, necessary to unwind? Uh, are you just stating a principle, or are you talking from knowledge of the situation of individual banks, uh, talking about concrete cases, and if so, how many? I'm talking about principles. OK, the question in the back there, please. The gentleman who's raising his hand there, yes. Thank you very much. Dan Michaels, Wall Street Journal. Uh, if you look at the health of the Eurozone banking system, it's pretty striking how it seems to have improved uh, over the past year or two. To what degree would you credit that to the broader economic recovery, and to what degree would you credit tighter supervision? Thank you. Well, I guess it's both. Uh, and I hope uh, recovery will help us to uh, have even uh, more success uh, in the future. Uh, but uh, consistent supervision, level playing field across the 19 countries is obviously a uh, big asset. We have uh, the, the benefit of the, the two worlds. Uh, we have the experience and expertise of national supervisors that is, are joining their efforts with ourselves to deliver supervision. And we have uh, distance uh, in the decision-making process, which is a big benefit. Uh, and we mentioned discussions with the, the European Commission before. Uh, we are uh, sister European institutions, so uh, we can uh, promote uh, the, the best interests of uh, the, the Union uh, more than if we were uh, uh, national uh, competent authorities or uh, ministries of finance uh, in different countries. We may so bold to say that um, on average, we raised the expectation um, of a supervisor how high the amount of capital, how high the capital ratio should be in the banking system uh, the last three years. I mean, that um, we can say too. So it is both, yes. yes. It's not only capital, it's uh, also much more easy to benchmark ourselves with the big supervisors of the planet. We benchmark our global CFEs with the UK ones, with the US ones, for example. So we have a better visibility as well. I think I had one more. Do you have questions still? Yeah? Yeah? One more. I think that's the. We have time oh, for one more. Thank you very much. I'm Stefan Scharf from Börsenzeit.
Sitzung. Uh, just an additional question on the Basel uh, III negotiations, um, Ms. Lautenschläger. Um, what do you expect, or could you give us an insight where the um, where it could lead to? Because uh, most of the discussion was about output floors, it was about use of internal models. Um, where where could be a compromise, and what would be your wish for a compromise? I'm, I I hope for your full understanding that I will not do so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know that many many different topics are on the table. We have operational risk, we have the standardized approach for credit risk, we have the, um, uh, the question of the IRBA and the input flaws, um, LGDs, uh, we have the leverage ratio and the GSIP factor, uh, we have um, the output flaws. So, so there are many floating topics, and now it depends how the whole picture looks like, and we will see what will come out of the discussions of the next six months, let us uh, say. I, I will not share, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I think there's one last question now. Yes, over there, the gentleman over there. Thank you, Michael Rasch, NZZ. Why is the ECB so keen on banking consolidation? A high competition in the market is good for the customers, so don't like the ECB to have customers low prices? Uh, over capacity uh, on the competition is uh, constraining the, 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 the profits of, of the banks. The, uh, there are a lot of uh, new development that are putting pressure on the profits of the bank, and over capacity is one of them. Uh, each, uh, on average, uh, euro area banks need to spend 65 uh, cents to earn one euro. That's a lot and there is something to, to be done. And again, not everywhere. We need enough uh, competition. But uh, globally, and in certain countries, uh, there is an overcapacity of uh, offering of banking services. And that is not uh, helping the profitability and hence the solvency of the banks, because those are the two sides of the coin. The business of the ECB is to make sure that the uh, business models are uh, sustainable enough. And sustainable means uh, uh, sol the banks are solvent and profitable. Uh, you cannot uh, go on, like it is the case now, not earning the cost of, the, of your capital for long. That's, uh, that's an issue, yes. You know, it is not our task to structure uh, banking systems. Yeah? But our task is to identify weaknesses and deficiencies. And um, the, the core of banking supervision is to have an assessment. Um, is the business model of a specific bank viable? Um, and not only viable at the current status today, but forward-looking for the next years. What kind of earnings can they have? What kind of risks are they taking in? And are they able to cover with their earnings the risks they are taking in? And if they are not able to do so, then the business model is not viable. Um, so from our perspective, it is not a question of does the one or the other bank have to consolidate, you know? But it is rather the question of um, do we have via the overcapacity in some of the national markets, markets a race to the bottom with regard to the margins, yeah, where the margins might not always cover the risks which um, uh, the banks take in, um, and where at the end the question of um, can they cover um, um, not only the risk but the um, capital cost too um, is at least um, at stake. Yeah? These are the two issues. So we've run out of time. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. And um, now that you can, you can, you know, leave on taking the lifts again since they seem to be working. Thank you very much. <laughs>